Greetings. I would like to begin by expressing my sincere thanks to the organizers of the Delphi Economic Forum for inviting me to chair this panel. It is an honor to chair a panel with my distinguished, esteemed colleagues here. My name is Jamal Kafadad, and I'm a professor of Ottoman history at Harvard University. It is my privilege to introduce the panelists distinguished, accomplished colleagues with several publications of great relevance for our topic. Our first speaker is Dr. Ioannis Grigoriadis, Associate Professor and Jean Monnet Chair of European Studies at the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at Bilkent University. He is also Senior Fellow and Head of the Program on Turkey at the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy. In the academic year 2018-19, he was visiting professor at the Cayman Modern Turkish Studies Program, Buffett Institute for Global Studies, Northwestern University. In the academic year 2016-17, he was IPC Stiftung Mercator Senior Research Fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin and Stanley J. Seeger Research Fellow at Princeton University. His research interests include comparative European and Turkish politics and history. Our second speaker is Dr. Hakan Erdem, a historian of the Ottoman Empire who holds a PhD in modern history from Oxford University. He worked at Boazici University between 1993 and 2002, and then moved to Sabanji University, where he has been since 2002, both of the universities being in Istanbul. He was also a visiting professor at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel in 1998 and 2001, and at George Washington University, USA in 2000. He specialized in the history of Ottoman slavery, modern state construction in the late Ottoman Empire, repercussions of the Greek War of Independence in the Ottoman Empire, introduction of the new conscript army, transformation of Ottoman political language and culture. Among his various publications, mention must be made of slavery in the Ottoman Empire and its demise, 1800-1909. He is also co-editor of two volumes on the Middle East, namely Histories of the Modern Middle East, New Directions, with Israel Gershoni and Ursula Wokuk, and Middle East Historiographies, narrating the 20th century with Israel Gershoni again and with Amy Singer. He authored two books in Turkish, Tarih Lenk, which is a work of historical criticism, and Torosyanın Acayip Hikayesi, which is a work on a purported World War I memoir. These books were published in 2008 and 2012, respectively. He is also the author of three novels in Turkish. Shükrü Ilıcak is our third speaker. Dr. Ilıcak pursued his studies in Turkey, Greece, and the USA, specializing in the so-called Ottoman Three Nations, namely the Greeks, Armenians, and Jews. He received his PhD degree from Harvard University in 2011, with a dissertation entitled A Radical Rethinking of Empire, Ottoman State and Society During the Greek War of Independence, 1821-1826. His dissertation investigates the Greek War of Independence as an Ottoman experience, exploring in particular how Sultan Mahmud II, who reigned between 1808 and 39, and the central state of the Ottoman Empire, central state elite tried to make sense of and reacted to the rapidly changing world around them. He has published broadly on the Greek War of Independence and the Three Nations. 
He is currently a fellow of the Institute for Mediterranean Studies in Rethymnon, Crete. Our fourth speaker, Dr. Christine Filiou, is professor in the Department of History at UC Berkeley. She is the author of two books on different aspects of the long 19th century in the Ottoman Empire and the emergence of Greece and Turkey out of that empire. Her first book, Biography of an Empire, Governing Ottomans in an Age of Revolution, was published in 2010, and the Greek edition is forthcoming in September with Alexandria Publications. That first book examines the changes in Ottoman governance resulting from the Greek War of Independence from the perspective of Greek Fenariot elites. Her new book, Turkey, A Past Against History, is fresh out of the printing press, published in 2021, with a Greek edition forthcoming in 2022, again with Alexandria, turns to the final decades of the Ottoman Empire and the transition to the Republic of Turkey from the perspective of a dissident opposition figure and satirist who experienced the changes firsthand. Fluent in both Greek and Turkish, she has spent her career researching both the conflicts and the moments of symbiosis between Greeks and Turks as the Ottoman Empire devolved and the modern states of Greece and Turkey took shape. I look forward to listening to my four dear colleagues. And without further ado, I turn to Dr. Yanis Gregoriadis for the first presentation of the panel. Yanis, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Kafadar, for your introduction and your very kind words. It's an honor and pleasure to be with you in this Delft Economic Forum panel that is going to participate in the commemoration of the bicentennial of the Greek War of Independence through shedding light on this, on this uh, in very important event, of this event of enormous historical proportions for our regions from an Ottoman point of view. Uh, my presentation is going to be shedding light on a side story of the Greek War of Independence that affected uh, a part of the Greek Orthodox Milet uh, that uh, was part of the Greek Orthodox world in the Ottoman Empire, but has uh, since the, the 19th century been relatively little studied by Greek historiography and by Ottoman historiography as well. So my presentation is going to look into how the Greek War of Independence affected the sectarian dynamics in Syria and why Syria matters. I think that Syria matters because it gives us a very interesting insight on how the identity dynamics within the Orthodox community of the Ottoman Empire played uh, from the 18th century all the way into the late 19th century and the early 20th century. So normally when we talk about the Greek War of Independence, we focus on its effect on the Balkans, of course, and this is very reasonable given the fact that uh, like in the Wallachian provinces and then Moldova there was the operation by Alexander Sipsilandis, then the war started in, in the Peloponnese, in uh, continental Greece and in the islands. But uh, it is important to highlight the effects of this event reached as far as possible. So I will be spending some time explaining why Aleppo matters in that respect and why the Greek War of Independence had a catalytic influence on the identity dynamics of, uh, of, not, of Syria throughout the 19th century. Why uh, this is the case? Well, I think it's important to remember that uh, uh, Syria was a territory far beyond the uh, reach of the ecumenical patriarchate. Syria was belonged ecclesiastically to the patriarchate of Antioch and throughout the Byzantine years these territories uh, were mostly beyond the reach of the Byzantine Empire. Since the 7th century the Umayyad, the Abbasid empires controlled uh, much of the Levant and although there were of course several wars between the Byzantine Empire and this uh, empires for reclaiming the territories these territories remain mostly beyond the real 
of the Byzantine Empire. So uh, the Greek Orthodox populations of Syria remained under the jurisdiction of the Patriarchate of Antioch, which was itself based first in Antioch and then in Damascus. But what is happening already in the late 17th century, and I think this is very important to highlight, is that uh, the Ottoman Empire considers uh, the Orthodox Church and the Ecumenical Patriarchate as uh, an institution that uh, should be supported against the attempts of Catholics to infiltrate uh, the Ottoman Empire through missionary activities and through the establishment of, of uh, uniate Greek Catholic communities in different parts of the Ottoman territory. This situation was present in the Aegean Island and in other parts of the, of the Balkan, but in the uh, late 17th, early 18th century, the area of Aleppo becomes uh, an area of intensive uh, missionary activity by mainly French missionaries. This is the time when the uh, French state and the Ottoman Empire have relatively good relations compared to other European states at the time. So there emerges a community which is Greek Catholic. So they are uh, belong to the Orthodox cultural right, and but they declare their allegiance to the Pope. And uh, they adopt, interestingly, a name that uh, used to be the name of the Greek Orthodox community of the early Arab empires, Melkites, so the royalists, practically, because in the, Arab, in the early Arab literature, the king was the Byzantine emperor. So, uh, as this happening in the early 18th century, the Ecumenical Patriarchate uh, requests from the Ottoman state to take over the administration of the Diocese of Aleppo, uh, claiming that uh, the local bishop who was appointed by the Patriarchate of uh, Antioch in Damascus uh, was uh, converting, was allowing the conversion of his population to, the, to Catholicism. So in that respect, we have an interesting uh, situation here whereby the Ottoman Empire considers the Orthodox Church to be more reliable and more trustworthy compared to the Catholic Church's activities. Of course, the Ottoman Venetian Wars in the late 16th, like late uh, 17th century, early 18th century, played a role in that respect. Uh, so this is, uh, this means that the uh, Patriarchate is uh, able to appoint a new bishop in, uh, in Aleppo and uh, the bishop that was already there converts to Catholicism himself. So we have a schism in the church of Aleppo that uh, defines the life of the Christian community of the city throughout the 18th century. So there is the Melkite community, Greek Catholic community of Aleppo, that is uh, hosting many important uh, uh, merchants, very influential local notables and authorities, on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is the ecumenical patriarchate and the local bishop that tries to, to make them uh, outcasts from the religious point of view and raise to the Ottoman authorities the risk that these activities pose for the Ottoman unity. And of course, under these circumstances, what we call as the millet system is slowly consolidated. Uh, it is uh, given uh, uh, fact in a recent historiography from the millet system that the millet system was not a product of uh, an agreement that dates back to the 15th century or 16th century, but it was the result of a long term series of arrangements between Ottoman authorities and the Ecumenical Patriarchate that led to some degree to the consolidation of the power of the Ecumenical Patriarchate over territories that were for many centuries beyond its reach. So, and this was the case both in the Balkans and in the Levant, as in the case of Aleppo. So, uh, the Patriarchate is able to uh, come closer to the Ottoman authorities and try to declare the Melkites as heretics that do enjoy, should not enjoy any support from authority, not have on any 
Jews, any pious foundations of the Christians, all this should belong to the Orthodox. So this is the situation that goes on throughout the 19th century. Interestingly, the Melkite community tries to refute the fact. The Melkite community tries to say that, no, we're not converts to a Catholicism of the 18th or 19th century. We are the true Orthodox Christians. How do they make this claim? They make this claim by referring to the attempts of union of churches in the 15th century, shortly before the fall of Constantinople, that led to this deep split of the Byzantine society between those who supported the union with the Catholic Church and those who opposed the union of the Catholic Church. So in that respect, the Melkites tried to present themselves as the true uh, successors of those who supported the union of churches between the Catholics, uh, the Catholic Orthodox Union back in the 15th century. Nevertheless, the Ottoman authorities avoid to take a clear position on this issue all the way until the 1818, like until the years, the very last years before the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence. And there is a very big irony in this intervention. Why? Because the person that is going to impose the Greek Orthodox views, the Ecumenical Patriarchate's views in Aleppo on the Melkites is a, an Ottoman official that would later be heavily involved in the suppression of the Greek War of Independence. And this is Kurshid Pasha. Kursid Pasha is the Vali, is the governor of Aleppo in 1818 when the Patriarchate decides to appoint a new bishop, uh, Bishop Gerasimus to Aleppo. And the appointment of this uh, new bishop is met with riots by the Melkite population of the city. Uh, and uh, Kursid Pasha takes a clear position in favor of the of the bishop that the ecumenical patriarchate sends and uh, suppresses uh, the riots by the Melkites and there are casualties. So there are people dead among the Melkite population in the context of the suppression of these casualties. What is interesting uh, is the argument that uh, uh, Kushit uh, uh, makes in front, of the in front of the Melkite leaders. So he's asking them, according to the sources, uh, and I refer here mainly to Bruce Masters' very important work on the history of the Aleppine Christian community and the Melkite community. So, uh, Hushit asks them, who are you? Are you Christians or Muslims or Jews? If you're not Muslims and Jews and you're Christians, then you must be obeying the Patriarchate, the, uh, the Patriarchate in, in Constantinople, in Constantinia. So he clearly doesn't allow for any other uh, uh, religious affiliation within the Ottoman realms. There's no, there's no space for Catholic or Greek Catholic millet. So in that respect, in 1818, we can witness the triumph of the uh, Greek Orthodox millet uh, and the triumph of the ecumenical patriarchate in his claim to represent all the Christian populations, the Orthodox populations within the Ottoman Empire. Well, this is going to be challenged in, in a few, very few years. As soon as the Greek War of Independence breaks out in 1821, uh, the patriarchate and the fanariots, who were considered to be responsible for the independence and who are those who had put all, all their influence on the Greek ortho, on the side of the Greek Orthodox community in Aleppo, they fall out of favor with Ottoman authorities. And uh, of course, there are, uh, there are the patriarch is hanged and there are sort of pogroms against Greek Orthodox communities in different parts of the Ottoman Empire. The Melkite community in Aleppo finds an opportunity to capitalize on these events. And interestingly, they argue along the line of the argument they made before that you see what happened in, uh, in, in the Peloponnese, in Mora, in the Morea. So this proves that the Melkites are the true room, as we told you before. We are the loyal subjects of the Ottoman Empire, the Orthodox. And here uh, they add to the Greek Orthodox of the Balkans, the Greek Orthodox of Aleppo as well. They are Yunnan. 
there are not room. So they are very different, and you were very unfair in treating us uh, the way you treated us three years ago. So, and this position has a very interesting effect. Uh, the Melkites take the upper hand in Aleppo. They are able to claim all the churches that they lost in 1818. And this, most importantly, and I think I would like to highlight the significance of this, leads to the recognition of different millets by the Ottoman authorities. So uh, the decision to recognize a Catholic millet as a result of the Greek War of Independence and what happened in Aleppo leads to the fragmentation of the millet system as it existed in the 18th and early 19th century in the Ottoman Empire. And I think that this is an event of enormous significance, not only for Greek history, but for Ottoman history as a whole, because this triggers the rise of several nationalist movements within the Ottoman Empire, as the Catholic, the Jewish millet, the Assyrian millet, the Bulgarian millet, and other millets will uh, emerge in the context of the 19th century. These uh, institutions will form the nucleus for the rise of very important nationalist movements that will transform the Ottoman Empire uh, in an irreversible way and will contribute, of course, to the demise of the Ottoman Empire and the establishment of the modern nation states as we know them since the end of the First World War. So uh, I think that this uh, story from Aleppo tells us a lot about how an event in the Southern Balkans could have a huge influence throughout the Ottoman Empire. And there's a big irony in that respect that when the Greek nation state was established, the Arab-speaking Orthodox of Aleppo or of Lebanon were never considered to be uh, part of the Greek imagined community. Uh, while the Turkish-speaking Orthodox of Anatolia were considered to be an essential element of the Greek Orthodox nation, of the Greek nation, I'm sorry, the Arab speakers, the Arab speaking, Arabic speaking populations of Syria, of Lebanon, of the Levant in general, were never considered as a part of the Greek nation. And uh, I think this is uh, an interesting irony of history when we compare what happened in 1818 and 1821, that the Greek Orthodox of Aleppo paid a high price for the outbreak of the War of Independence, but they were never considered to be part of the Greek nation thereafter. So I'll stop here as I run out of time. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to our discussion later. Thank you, Yanis. This is a very auspicious beginning for a bridge conversation, I'm sure. Our next speaker is Dr. Adam Hakan, please. Uh, thank you. First of all, I also thanks, thank you the organizers of the Delphi Economic Forum. And I also thank Yanis for this uh, very good uh, beginning. I'll just uh, almost continue where he left. I'll start with uh, terminology as uh, one of my favorite pastimes uh, as a historian. Uh, we say uh, Greek Revolution. Truly, it was a revolution of a huge, uh, momentous, uh, monumental uh, character. There's no doubt about that. Like its ilk uh, in the 19th century elsewhere, uh, like the Bolivarian revolutions in uh, Latin America, uh, like, in fact, uh, a century later, the Turkish uh, Revolution, but it was a multifaceted uh, event uh, or series of events uh, that transformed not only the uh, people in uh, what we call today Greece, but the whole of uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. Uh, it has many aspects. It was a rebellion, a revolt, a war of independence, a war of liberation, a civil war in uh, many terms. And it was a, a revolution. So the, this uh, several uh, callings of it, several names uh, need not to be mutually exclusive. Then uh, what about the other part of the compound, the Greek part? Uh, is this also a complicated thing? Yes, I think uh, to a certain extent, even more complicated. 
uh, the Ottoman Empire had it, had its large uh, Greek community, and uh, they called themselves uh, Romoi, uh, the Romans, uh, and uh, the Ottomans accepted that uh, without any uh, questioning. Uh, called them Rum, like the other peoples of uh, the Middle East, like the Persians, like the Arabs. They were Rum, meaning uh, Roman. Uh, then came the revolution. Then came the uh, kind of uh, declarations of uh, revolution, like the one issued by Alexander Ypsilantis in the Principalities. There, he talked about uh, Helenoi. Uh, the Ottomans never heard of this, uh, but the, his declaration had to be translated into Turkish, Ottoman Turkish. Uh, they couldn't simply uh, call it, the translators call it uh, the Greeks, because they had their own Greeks, and the, the, Greek, the Greeks uh, had a name, uh, Romoi, or Rum, as the case might be, depending on the native language of the uh, speaker. Uh, so, uh, precisely at this moment, uh, an ancient Arabic uh, name for uh, Greeks, uh, and uh, Greece, uh, I, uh, ultimately from Ionia, Yunnan, uh, came very handy for the Ottomans. Now uh, they translated uh, Helenoi as uh, Yunnan, Yunani. Very good. And the country was Yunanistan, with the famous uh, Persian ending, like other uh, Istans, Stans. This is where the Greeks uh, stand, basically, Yunanistan. So once they uh, established their uh, terminology, uh, if only uh, not to use the old Ottoman terms uh, Rum and Rumeli, uh, the Ottomans established a new terminology, uh, Yunan, Yunanistan. Then comes the surprise, in a way, uh, once one Ottoman uh, document at the start of the revolution commented uh, on the term Elas, Yunanistan, this time in Turkish, Greece, that is Yunanistan, Greece, what unspeakable nonsense is this? So, uh, yes, after all, there is an entity called uh, Yunanistan, Greece, Greece of the uh, revolutionaries, but it is utterly nonsensical. So, uh, the first Ottoman uh, reception is flat denial and denigration of the revolutionaries. All of them were bandits, Eshkia in uh, Ottoman Turkish. Uh, never paying any attention between clefts or the kinds of uh, Todori Kolokotronis or, you know, the Itzanti brothers. All of them were Eshkia. So uh, there is no country called uh, Greece, Yunanistan. There is a flat denial. It is utterly uh, unacceptable. Uh, and at times, they, they seemed to have been vindicated when, for example, uh, Kapodistrias was assassinated uh, during the, the turbulences of the Greek uh, civil war. And uh, one Ottoman document again comments, uh, it was clear that the government of such bandits would create such results. Uh, so, the, the first reaction is uh, non-acceptance, uh, call it denial. However, it means, of course, it, 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 it implies that uh, the Ottoman administrators utterly failed to grasp the goals of Greek revolutionaries, uh, you know, they made no difference whatsoever between the Greek Revolution and previous revolutions uh, or revolts of the subject uh, classes. 
uh, you know, for example, when uh, the army of uh, the Egyptian governor Muhammad Ali suppressed the revolt uh, on the island of uh, Crete, uh, the Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman, you know, the administrators uh, sent feelers and they tried to assess the damage on the one side on the villages and try to learn the intentions of the uh, Greeks. Uh, would they join us, us uh, again? Uh, would they join the Ottoman administrators, uh, administration again if we, uh, if we forgive the taxation for such and such years? So this was a kind of attitude. Yes, it tried to react to the Greek uh, war of independence, but it no never occurred to the Ottomans that the Greece, Greeks, in fact, wanted to be independent. So they were still trying to uh, find out whether the Greeks, defeated Greek uh, revolutionaries in this case, were willing to join the Ottoman Imperium once again. Uh, so after this uh, stage of uh, dismissing the revolution as such, uh, we we should move to a different uh, sort of uh, view or point of angle. Uh, the fact that the Ottoman administrators did not want to acknowledge such a thing as Greek Revolution, Greece, or Greek people in the sense uh, of uh, Illinois doesn't mean that the revolution didn't have any impact on the Ottoman system. As I said at the very uh, beginning, it profoundly transformed not only Greece but the Ottoman uh, Empire. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the initial knee-jerk responses of the Ottoman uh, administrators to the Greek uh, Revolution. You know that includes you know, a variety of uh, measures, but I'm not going to talk uh, unless I'm, uh, I'm asked uh, questions, specific questions. I just mentioned two uh, important uh, monumental uh, events uh, that were set off by the Greek uh, Revolution. One is the direct uh, consequence, the other one is indirect. The first one is the evolution of the Central Ottoman army, the Janissaries, uh, towards the end of the uh, war in 1826, uh, June. That's interesting because uh, not so long ago, in 1808, at the beginning of Mahmud II's reign, there was civil war between the modern army, the Sekpans, and the Janissaries in the streets of Istanbul, and nobody could overcome the other party. There was an impasse, and the Sultan made a formal deal with the Janissaries. The Janissaries asked for, implored for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, implored for amnesty of the uh, Sultan. And in return for that, the Sultan promised that he would never ever establish another army, but keep the Janissaries. However, in 1826, he seemed to have broken his pledge and abolished the Janissary army by fire and sword. How could that uh, happen? Actually, uh, I followed the story of the abolition of the Janissary army from documentation. Uh, available to us. <clears throat> there, uh, mention is made of uh, Greek uh, revolution a lot. The Janissaries are accused of uh, uselessness uh, against or vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Greek uh, rebels. There is a specific Janissary contingent uh, who were badly defeated uh, before Athens sometime in the uh, in the in the skirmishes so the, the the moral of the story from the viewpoint of the Ottoman Sultan was that you see I mean they are unable to defeat even the subjects 
how could we expect them to defend the empire again against other empires? So there was a large consensus uh, in society and at several layers of Ottoman state that the Janissaries should abolish. Uh, and such indeed was the case. The moment they abolished a new army, a new conscript citizen army was uh, proclaimed. Uh, and uh, from this date on, uh, you know, middle of the June 1826 on, uh, in you know, in the in the history of uh, Ottoman Turkish modernization, it is uh, it is it is uh, told uh, in, in a very rosy uh, way that the last stumbling block on the way of uh, reform, the Janissaries were finally done away with and uh, therefore uh, you know the, the sultan could engage in uh, reform meaning uh, more often than not uh, state uh, centralization in the ottoman uh, context uh, reforms from uh, above and uh, then it's a short step from uh, the evolution of the Janir series to the modernization of the Tanzimat, uh, 1839. And in a way, you can follow the uh, story up until the uh, establishment of Turkish Republic. So the Greek Revolution, in an odd way, uh, not openly pronounced like that, but uh, is instrumental in the modernization of uh, the Ottoman Empire. And in the end, uh, a parallel nation state, this time in uh, Anatolia, admittedly in a belated uh, way, some hundred years later, but uh, still it is a response to the Greek revolution or the series of events uh, that were started uh, due to the Greek uh, revolution. So, the, of course, I mean, we can criticize this, uh, but this is uh, a different story. Uh, the indirect uh, impact, one indirect impact, is the quarrel uh, between uh, the Sultan and his uh, Egyptian uh, governor or viceroy, uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha of uh, Egypt. Uh, he sent his navy defeated at Navarino. He sent his son, Ibrahim Pasha, uh, who basically uh, crushed the rebellion, but uh, he faced a coalition and in the end he had to withdraw to uh, Egypt, uh, as, as, as we all know. But the Sultan happened to have promised uh, several uh, posts uh, to the family on Crete in mainland uh, Greece, uh, in the Moria, uh, but since it was a defeat for the Ottoman uh, armies uh, and the empire, the Sultan could not keep his pledge. The Egyptians spent money and uh, in a way they asked for compensation elsewhere, in Syria, in Palestine. The Ottoman Sultan uh, declined this. Then there was yet another civil war between the Ottoman Empire, Central Ottoman Empire and uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha of uh, Egypt fought in two successive uh, waves uh, in early uh, 1830s and uh, once more in uh, 1839 great powers uh, interfered etc but uh, today again uh, many historians accept that uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha was a forerunner of Mahmud II's uh, reforms in more than one way I don't see it personally uh, like that. I mean, it's more of a, a dialogue rather than uh, one side impact. I mean, the Central Ottoman Empire had its impact on the Egyptian uh, province, say during the times of uh, Selim III, but uh, the Egyptian province had its uh, impact on the Central Ottoman Empire during Mehmed Ali Pasha's time uh, in 1830s. Uh, I mean, he has an official newspaper and Ottoman, uh, Central Ottoman uh, government uh, has one. So in a way, uh, this indirect event uh, as well uh, had uh, transformative uh, powers on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, 
actually all layers of Ottoman uh, society. Uh, things, of course, you know, uh, can be likened to a billard uh, game. You know, the, the revolution itself was uh, the ball. I mean, <laughs> uh, if you like, uh, as you wish. Uh, but uh, or could be another. Enough. I'm not good at uh, games, but uh, the very fact is that it it it, it was, it has been a pivotal. Uh, series of events that changed a lot in the Ottoman Empire. This was not grasped at first by the uh, Ottoman administrators uh, themselves, but uh, in the end, uh, after the usual stages of denial, denigration, trauma, etc., uh, came the reconciliation <laughs> as well, part. To the point that Ottomans accepted the independence of a country called Greece, so they stopped talking about such a nonsensical uh, name, uh, Yunanistan. They accepted Yunanistan. Not only that, they accepted Yunanistan. Uh, they opened up uh, an embassy in Athens and uh, sending an Ottoman Greek. This time, not a Yunan, but a Rum, Musurus Pasha, as the ambassador. So, the, meaning that. Uh, the both identities, thanks to the revolution, had to uh, live hand in hand for a, a considerable uh, uh, time. And I think I should stop here. Thank you, Hakan. Thank you. I think Shukri will just follow from this rather smoothly. So I turn yes. to Shukri for the third presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wrote my PhD dissertation on the Greek War of Independence under the supervision of Professor Kafadar, who is our chair tonight, and examined this very significant historical event as an Ottoman experience. For my research, I mostly use uh, archival documents from the Ottoman state archives, which are preserved in, in Istanbul. Almost 50,000 documents related to this singular event alone exist in these archives, um, providing us with a treasure trove of exciting information. The primary importance of these documents is that they are a clear testimony of the larger imperial context in which the Greek Revolution evolved and proved successful. Through these documents, we acquire penetrating insights into the workings of Ottoman governance, imperial allegiances, the military, the navy, the commissariat, the economy and human capital during the revolutionary years. We learn extensively about the political and military forces and allegiances, the sublime port strive to mobilize to fight its battles against the Greek revolutionaries and also about the ways in which it kept the Greek communities that did not rise up under control. The mass of information in these documents clearly denotes a highly ineffective and failing state which could hardly perform its core functions and exercise only nominal authority over much of its territory, and a desperate but eager Mahmoud II, who was the Ottoman Sultan throughout the Greek Revolution. At the time of the Greek Revolution, the Ottoman central state had essentially no army and limited means to raise one. The navy was totally inept and could hardly sail out of the Dardanelles. The sublime port severely lacked the uh, military and naval manpower to put down a national uprising that broke out almost simultaneously throughout the empire where Greek populations constituted the majority. The Ottoman state was literally at the mercy of Albanian warlords and mercenaries for the suppression of the Greek uprising until the arrival of the Egyptian forces in 1825. So today I am going to talk about what had happened to the Ottoman army and for this it is necessary to examine briefly the preceding decade. Although full to the brim with events bringing about momentous changes in the fabric of the Ottoman polity, this is one of the most understudied periods of Ottoman history. 
Um, <clears throat> the Treaty of Bucharest of May 1812, which ended the Russo-Ottoman War of 1806-1812, and Russia's revised non-aggressive imperial agenda in the post-Napoleonic world order brought about the favorable conditions for a certain clique at the sublime port to deal with the state's internal affairs and to redefine its boundaries with the provincial magnates. We call these provincial magnates the Ayans in Turkish, and you can consider them as the Ottoman counterparts of the lords or dukes in England. In other words, hereditary dynastic families that held the military, political, and financial power in the provinces. The Ayans uh, had carved out almost autonomous statements for themselves in the previous half century, and since the Russo-Ottoman War of 1786-1774, the Ottoman central state could not raise an army or taxes without their support. However, in the last Russian war, I mean the uh, Russo-Ottoman War of 1806-1812, they declined to lend their military and financial support to the extent desired by the Sublime Port. Luckily for the Sublime Port, hostilities were not resumed in the 1812 campaign season due to, due to Napoleon Bonaparte's expedition to Russia, and the war came to an end. In the following decade, the Sublime Port endeavored to establish a capable defense system. It tried to save itself from being at the mercy of the ions by uniting its borderlands under a central authority and by establishing a new provincial army under the command of imperial viziers whose soldiers would not turn tail and flee when they faced the disciplined bayonet using Russian soldiers and light artillery. Hence, in February 1813, the Sublime Port officially announced and embarked upon a military and administrative project to reassert itself in the provinces. Now the imperial viziers, who were under direct control of the Sublime Port, would replace the Ayans in the provinces. The project brought uh, imperial viziers who derived their power mostly from the employment of Albanian mercenaries into direct confrontation with the provincial magnates and allowed the former to subject the locals to additional extortionary practices, causing extreme economic and political distress in the provinces. What followed was, to all intents and purposes, a civil war between the Ottoman central state and a myriad of provincial magnates of varying calibers, religions, ethnicities, and levels of popular support. Official Ottoman documents and chronicles allow us to trace uh, dozens of urban and rural uprisings led by provincial magnates throughout the empire against the sublime ports encroachment. The last and probably the most significant one of these magnates was the legendary Tosk Albanian governor of Ioannina, Ali Pasha Tepedenli, who declined to submit to the sublime port and revolted in 1820. It is not possible to follow every mutiny in detail. We learn about the uprisings of most minor provincial power brokers only when their severe heads made it to Istanbul or through the orders for the confiscation of their patrimony. Popular support to the provincial power brokers' resistance also varied in several provinces. Uh, the events were probably limited to the mutiny of the warlords and their men, and either eventually died away or were suppressed by the sub sublime port. It seems that in some provinces, the common folk were mere observers of the fight between the central state and the, and the magnates, whereas in others, especially in the non-Turkish provinces, the magnates found substantial popular support for their resistance against the sublime port. Um, and we are talking about real for warfare with thousands of soldiers on both sides and sieges, sieges of such large cities as Diyarbakir, Aleppo and Ioannina, which were laid by imperial viziers and lasted for many months. 
I suggest the term deionization uh, instead of centralization for this procedure, because while what was destroyed and dismantled is apparent, for for instance, the elimination of a magnate or of, or of his entire family and retinue, what exactly replaced the old structures appears to have varied according to the particular conditions in each province and did not necessarily result in establishing the authority of the central state. In any event, the Greek Revolution broke out right in the middle of this period of immense transition. By 1821, the process in the Asiatic uh, provinces of the empire was almost complete and terminated in the European provinces due to the beginning of the Greek Revolution. After almost a decade of internal, internal warfare, large sections of the empire were ruined and the sublime port had exhausted its pool of military manpower. The elimination of some of the most powerful provincial political and military brokers had serious implications for troop recruitment. Provincial magnates were toppled hastily without replacing their networks and infrastructures with effective alternatives. Consequently, the imperial visitors, such as um, Kutahi and Hurshid, who replaced the magnates, found it extremely difficult to recruit mobilize and fund soldiers, strongly reminiscent of the circumstances attending the dissolution of several ancient empires, the sublime port was obliged to resort to the Ottoman violence market, whose most important providers at the time were Muslim Albanian magnates, Kun warlords. Let me give you some figures so that you have a better understanding of the effect of the sublime ports deionization project on the Greek Revolution. Um, for the summer campaign of 1811 against the Russians in the lower Danube region, 153 ethnic Turkish ions from Asia Minor alone were ordered to join the Imperial Army. Twelve years later, however, in 1823, for the first planned and somewhat coordinated military expedition of the sublime port for the suppression of the Greek uprising, there was not a single ion from Asia Minor in the Ottoman army encampment in Larissa. Uh, and the mere 12,000 out of 50,000 soldiers had been recruited by the ions of Rumelia, in other words, the European provinces of the empire. The rest, the rest were Albanian mercenaries. However, the sublime part made a serious miscalculation by composing the bulk of the army from an ethnic group, which was not external to the issue. As the insurgent Greeks' immediate neighbors, Albanian warlords and mercenaries were at the very heart of the matter and were eager to pursue their survival instincts. They followed their own agendas to the utmost of their capability and remained quite unresponsive to the sublime port's demands. Their averseness to put on a united Muslim front against the Greeks proved to be the most important obstacle for the sublime port to suppress the Greek revolution. The Albanians did everything in their power to paralyze the sublime port's operations. The policy of the Albanians during the actual contest of the Greeks with the sublime port, though not allowed, was in fact that of an armed neutrality, secretly contracting the Turks when they were likely to gain the ascendant and checking the Greeks when they were inclined to encroach upon the Albanian interests temporizing and evading as far as possible the execution of orders were the most essential qualities of the Albanian armed neutrality policy. Ottoman army encampments and castles in and around the Moria were in a state of continuous unrest and trouble, mostly because of Tosk Albanian mercenaries. Clearly, to the sublime port, the Greek revolution was just as much an Albanian problem as it was a Greek one. 
This is an unknown aspect in the historiography of the Greek War of Independence, independence because mainstream, mainstream Greek historiography has de ottomanized the Greek Revolution and has taken it out of the larger world in which it had evolved and moved it to a universe of its own. As a result, most students of the period tend to downplay the role of the Albanian element. One way to achieve this is to treat Muslim Albanians as Turks, either by naming them Turk Albani or completely ignoring their Albanian identity, and Christian Albanians as Greeks, reducing the events to a tug of war between two ostensible sides. The picture is much more complicated though. On the field, the Greek War of Independence was a power struggle among a multitude of players with incessant realignment of interests and redistribution of power. So can the Greek Revolution be considered as a link in the chain of ongoing uprisings throughout the Ottoman Empire? Mainstream historiography on the Greek Revolution is already a panegyric account of the deeds of the Greek magnates Kroon warlords. Although more recent, recent Greek historiography tends to give more credit to the enlightened and politicized radical Greeks who shared the sparks of enlightenment with the Greek magnates, it requires extensive research to assess how apprehensive were the Greek Kojabashides, Kapetani and Armatoli uh, of the sublime ports boundary shifting enterprise in the provinces and whether they were waiting for their turn to come after the Albanians, after the Tepetan revolt. Let's not forget these Greek provincial power brokers were, were the actual driving force of the Greek revolution by providing the bulk of the fighting power. Um, I guess I should stop here and maybe we can discuss some issues afterwards. Thank you, Shikru. Thank you for a close up. And now we turn to Christine Filiou for our final presentation to be followed by a discussion amongst us. Please, Christine, it's yours. Thank you so much, Jamal. I'd like to thank the organizers of the Delphi Economic Forum for their kind invitation to speak here. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today, and I'm happy to add one or two more layers of complication to the discussion that my esteemed colleagues and fellow panelists have already gotten going. Um, I'd like to take a moment to applaud and commend the organizers for including this on the bicentennial year of the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence from Ottoman rule. Ottoman views of the Greek War of Independence. Let's think about a few other comparable contexts in order to understand how unthinkable it would be, and thus how extraordinary it is to be included at all in a forum such as this, organized in Greece and by Greeks. Let's take, for instance, the bicentennial of the Declaration of Independence in the United States in 1976, for instance. It would have been totally unthinkable and even bizarre in 1976 to include a panel on British views of the American Revolution. Let's take the example of the centennial that happened, that passed already in, uh, in 2019, of the uh, start of the Turkish War of Independence from Ottoman rule, which, which is actually what it was, in addition to being perceived by Turks as the War of Independence from British, French, and Greek occupation. Indeed, in my latest book, I do look at Ottoman, at what you might consider Ottoman views of the Turkish War of Independence, but that is for another day. Um, that centennial in any case, and as far as I know, did not see nearly the level of fanfare in 2019 as this bicentennial is seeing in Greece in 2021. Perhaps 2023 with the centennial of the establishment of the Republic of Turkey, we will see more activity. But even so, to celebrate or even discuss the Turkish War of Independence from the perspective of the Ottoman government in Istanbul, not to mention from the point of view of Greek communities of Asia Minor or the Greek army would be anathema quite literally. And indeed, there is no direct political benefit to this conversation that we're having about Ottoman views of the Greek War of Independence. 
In fact, given the framework of discussion, there could actually be many negative political consequences to it. Would looking at these events through an Ottoman lens mean that we're siding with the empire? With so much tension between Greece and Turkey right now, with so much aggression being threatened, with the perennial political conflict seeing one of its worst moments in recent memory, why bother imagining and public, publicly discussing Ottoman perspectives? And for me, it is a matter of multiple Ottoman perspectives, not just one, uh, of the Greek War of Independence. Are we lionizing the Ottomans and therefore, quote, the Turks? Um, what benefit does this new perspective bring to the bicentennial conversation of about 1821? And positionality. Uh, my colleagues speaking with me on this panel, scholars who've done important research on perceptions and policies uh, taken by the Ottoman state in the course of the Greek Revolution are hardly cheerleaders for the Ottoman state, and neither am I. Uh, we're scholars and particularly historians, uh, and in fact, this means we're not cheerleaders for anyone. Instead, we're interested in trying to understand the causes, processes, experiences, and predicaments of those involved on multiple sides of the conflict between Greeks fighting for an independent state and the array of Ottoman state loyalists in the 1820s. When we go back and read the documents from the various groups involved in the conflicts of the 1820s, as my esteemed colleagues and fellow panelists have demonstrated in at least three different ways, things look very different and much more complicated. And this can be uncomfortable because it unsettles our assumptions about the past about the neat lines of conflict, and perhaps might force us to think differently about the present. Allow me to quote from a master historian of the 19th century. Men make their own history, but they do not make it, they, they do not make it under circumstances of their own choosing, but under circumstances given and transmitted from the past. What makes the Greek War of Independence and the establishment of the independent state of Greece so extraordinary, of course, is that some men came together and actually radically changed their circumstances to the extent that they could. Many, I'm sure, would have preferred to forego great power tutelage then as now, uh, so even they were not free to shape all of their circumstances in every way. They succeeded in carving out a politically sovereign entity based on belonging to a Greek linguistic and ethnic identity and adherence to Greek Orthodox Christianity. They broke free from Ottoman sovereignty and created an internationally recognized state and a new consensus among themselves for how to organize their polity. In order to understand that achievement and to grasp its meaning then and now, I will complicate the picture because it was not just a conflict that implicated Ottomans in the sense of those officially associated with the Ottoman state and Greeks as, opposed, as in Greek revolutionaries. There was another category or many others. Uh, as we all know, many more Greeks, many more Greek people were left out of this settlement for an independent Greece than were inhabitants and citizens of the original Greek state. Namely, Greek Orthodox Christians who remained in the Ottoman Empire. And each of you has referred to them in different ways and in passing. Uh, in my work in Biography of an Empire, I carefully considered how history and how the predicament of the empire was their perspective in the 1820s and how their circumstances had been shaped and how they attempted to shape them in different ways over the course of the previous century. In order to do this, one has to consider what it meant after all to be an Ottoman, for by the early 19th century, it was not a self-evident category. And both Shukru and uh, Hakan explained the tensions within that category and the kinds of accusations um, and real anxiety that was happening about what it meant to be a ruler and a member of the ruling class or not at that moment. Neither was the term coterminous with Turk as we might imagine it and use that term today. In this frame, when we try to break free of anachronism and really understand the moment and the conflict as it was experienced by those living through it, these Greek Orthodox subjects of the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s, and particularly those elites that called themselves and were called Phanariots, were not yet the quote, unredeemed Greeks looking to Athens. This would happen only decades later. They were Ottoman subjects whose world revolved around Istanbul or Constantinople, 
the Ottoman capital, the former Byzantine capital, and the seat of the Greek Orthodox Church. They lived under a complex set of circumstances, which were not of their own choosing. They were guaranteed nothing in the Ottoman realm, neither equality nor rights, legal, social, or cultural. And yet they had shaped, they had shaped some of their circumstances, achieved a remarkable level of wealth and influence, not just in commerce and uh, with respect to the patriarchy, but with the Ottoman imperial government um, due to their involvement in provincial administration, diplomacy, and administration of the Greek Orthodox Milet or confessional community. And I would add that in the months and few years leading up to 1821, um, I even demonstrate that there were several signs of a kind of institutionalization or formalization of their power. Um, and these signs prompt some really interesting <laughs> and potentially very unsettling questions about the processes that were going on within the broader Greek community at the time and what some of the triggers might have been for the initial outbreak of rebellions in Moldavia in early 1821. So certainly, as we all know, some Fenariots fought and even led the movement for Greek independence. Uh, Alexander Ypsilantis and Mavrogordatos come to mind, uh, but they left behind others who ascended to positions of power and wealth in the empire in the 1830s and after, uh, the neo fenariots And we even see in at least one case, um, even in the thick of conflict in the 1820s, when you know our assumption and, and really what we know is that Greeks were eliminated, fenariots were eliminated from these positions um, due to the suspicion that they were collaborating with the Greek revolutionaries. Um, we even see at least one case of one of them, namely Stephanos Vogoridis, who is um, continued to be invested with a position with the Kaimakam of Moldavia, and then as a negotiator um, with the Greeks on behalf of the Ottomans in the 1820s. So even in the worst moment of that conflict, they still had a need for someone of that Fenariot class. Um, of course, from the 1830s and after, these neo um, would go on, again, as mentioned by Hakan, some of them would go on to even represent the Ottoman Empire, for instance, in Athens, and then in London for much of the Victorian period, um, Kostaki Musuros Pasha. And even later in the crucial negotiations, um, such as the Congress of Berlin in 1878, Alexander Kara Pasha. These Greeks were embedded in many sectors of Ottoman governance uh, before 1821 as after in different ways. Um, they were interpreters, before particularly, they were interpreters within the Ottoman military, administrators and tax collectors in the Danubian principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia, uh, negotiators for matters between the Ottoman state and foreign states, between the Ottoman state and the ecumenical patriarchate, and between the patriarchate of Constantinople and the other patriarchates, monasteries, and communities within the empire. They were procurers of food and other necessities, as well as luxury items for the palace and for the capital. They were embedded in patronage networks within the Ottoman court and in the military leadership, as I show in the book, particularly with the examples of Khaled Efendi and Husrev Pasha, some of the most important figures of that moment. Um, and yet, of course, they had no formal share in governance or imperial policy. <clears throat> on the one hand, their presence and influence was contingent on the favor of the Sultan and his viziers. On the other, their skills were incre increasingly necessary for the survival of the Ottoman state in the international realm. The Greek Revolution was experienced very differently by these communities, and particularly the Greek community in Istanbul, who suffered massacres and burning of churches and pogroms, as others have said, um, as reprisals for the far off rebellions, first in Moldavia and then in the Peloponnese. Um, and I go into great detail about these massacres in the spring of 1821 in the Ottoman capital. I do not have time to provide you with those details, but suffice it to say that the hanging of Patriarch Gregorios V was but one event in a shocking series of atrocities. And even that hanging appears very different when we see it through the eyes of a local Greek eyewitness, which I, as I do in my book. 
I do not make these points simply for the sake of myth busting, uh, but as a historian to remind us that when events come to take on such monumental importance in the story that a nation tells about itself, we often lose the connection with the fact that these were actual events experienced by people in their own historical context. To try to understand the hanging of Patriarch Gregorios V or the Greek War of Independence more generally from the perspective of Phanariots is in fact a project to recontextualize the movement for an achievement of Greek statehood in its contemporary moment. Separate from the aspirations at the time or the ideologies, politics, and historical narrative that took shape later. And these Fenariot elites who remained in the Ottoman capital also experienced firsthand the larger transformation in Ottoman governance that resulted from the Greek Revolution, including, I argue in the book, the dramatic shift in the relationship between the Ottoman state and the sphere of diplomacy and geopolitics as the great powers and Congress Europe took shape. This shift, along with the institutional reforms known as the Tanzimat, which began in earnest in 1839, actually no opened new opportunities for neo fanariots with their skills and connections within the empire and in Europe, independently of the new Greek state that was developing alongside in Athens. These Greeks did not have a sovereign entity of their own in the sense of a nation state, but their experience as Greeks is worth our attention. Their relationship to the Ottoman state, to their local Greek communities and foreign envoys, and ultimately to the Greek where some people would go attain citizenship and return to Ottoman realms, uh, was complex and generally unstable, which meant that main maintaining an equilibrium, indeed surviving, took constant care. This is an uncomfortable topic, and these are uncomfortable questions for sure. If we apply national categories onto the past, these people look like traitors to the Greek nation and collaborators with the Ottomans. And believe me, I spare no one in my work. My recent book looks at Turks who have been made out to be traitors to the Turkish nation because of the positions they took against the Turkish national movement in 1919. I wish I could give you an easy take home message about these communities of Greeks who remained outside the bounds of the Greek state. Uh, I'm afraid I cannot, <laughs> um, but I can say that the uh, Ottoman views of the Greek War of Independence were not limited to the official decrees of the Ottoman central government, as important as those are, nor to the massacres and other reprisals carried out by the Muslim Ottoman subjects and soldiers in response to the rebellions. Instead, this Hellenism, these homogenis, which is a word that has not yet been brought up, and I think it's worth discussing if we have a few moments in the discussion, predated the Greek War of Independence and the Greek Kingdom. They also continued to live as homogenis uh, long after. They were attached in important and profound ways to Ottomans, despite being constantly suspect in, their, in the eyes of their overlords and harboring deep ambivalence toward them in return. These Fenariots had different interests, both from the Ottoman state and from their Greek national counterparts. We owe it to ourselves as Greeks, those of us that are Greek, uh, and as historians of the Ottoman Empire and of Hellenism to consider distinctive. Doing so enriches our understanding of what it did and did not mean to achieve independent statehood for Greece. Indeed, consideration of multiple perspectives and especially the uncomfortable ones like that of the Fenariots, is at the heart of democracy and democratic society. And the best sign of Greece's vibrant democracy is the inclusion of this panel in the Delphi Economic Forum this year. And with that, I close. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank, you. <coughs> Thank you very much, dear colleagues. It was a pleasure to listen and to reflect while you kept adding layers and layers of complexity without losing sight of the fact that we are thereby, by adding complexity, not just making things complicated, but reaching a deeper understanding. And, and I'm also quite appreciative of Christine's final comments that uh, that deeper understanding may also be very meaningful for us to construct our present and future in a uh, better way. 
it's not idle academic exercise. And thank you, thank you all for both giving us <clears throat> close-ups, some more so than others, but also keeping the larger, broader picture of the Ottoman Empire constantly there as it moved and shifted while the Greek Revolution unfolded just before and after, starting in Syria and touching on Egypt, uh, bringing in the Albanians, and finally with the Greek community all over the empire and beyond as the story of the Greek state was happening. Uh, but there is probably an even broader kind of world picture that we did not touch here. You know, the, the, the literature on the age of revolutions is quite familiar to all of you. Some of you have done more work on it than I ever have. Uh, what about that larger international setting of an age of revolutions, even if we don't agree with that historiography, but we do know of the French Revolution, of the American Revolution, and various other intellectual and political developments that that are known, or at least seem to me to be obvious, to have made some inroads into the way things uh, sh took shape. Uh, would you care to comment on the larger international setting and how that played into the story of the Greek Revolution? I have other questions too, of course, depending on how much time we can have, but uh, let's start with this one. And whoever wishes to take it, starting with Yanis, following the same order. Dr. Grigoriadis, if you care to answer it. Well, I, I think that the Greek War of Independence uh, had roots in uh, the neo-Hellenic Enlightenment movement that is very much a European, Central Western European intellectual uh, movement that uh, produces a lot of thinking about Greek identity, the whole discussion between Hellene and uh, Rum and, or Romnios and this whole discussion about where do, would the Greek nation stand is very much related to developments in uh, the late 18th, early 19th century. There are different understandings of where Greece should stand. There's the Rigas Velestin, Lis Rigas Pereos understanding that's more inclusive and kind of uh, envisions a uh, commonwealth uh, coming out of the Ottoman Empire. So he's not really thinking of establishing a Greek nation state per se, but tries to find space for the Turks, for the Albanians, for the Jews, for everybody who lives in the Ottoman Empire, of course. Uh, and uh, I do think that the constitutions of the revolutionary years reflect very much this very interesting and very fruitful intellectual fermentation that begins in the big uh, Greek diasporic communities of Western and Central Europe. Then it moves into the big Ottoman cities where there are these Ottoman Greek communities that are educated and they're in good connections with this diasporic communities. And this is all reflected into uh, the texts of the Greek uh, revolution, the constitutional text and the discussions. Of course, reality uh, and sort of uh, realism, political realism, it means that uh, the Greek uh, state will not be a republic, will be a kingdom, and it will be an absolutist kingdom. But all these discussions are going to be reflected into what transpired in Greek intellectual and political history throughout the 19th century. So it's not a surprise that Greece establishes uh, a parliamentary system like relatively early compared to other uh, European states in the 19th century. So there are many interesting connections. We don't hear you, Hakan. You're, you're muted. You don't? Am now I? Now we do. Now we do. Yes, now, you do. now you're fine. Yeah. Okay, so I go on. 
Uh, I was just saying that uh, at one point, uh, Fidu uh, said that people lived the revolution in their own way. I mean, this was inescapably uh, so. I mean, people had different uh, experiences. Yes, there was an international uh, dimension to it. I mean, the, when uh, Lord Byron, for example, uh, came to fight on behalf of the Greeks, the, the Ottomans recorded his name, that he was a British uh, noble. And uh, when he died, his death was uh, recorded uh, near Missilongi. Uh, at one point, the Ottomans realized that uh, there was more to the Greek Revolution than an ordinary revolution on grounds of uh, tax grievances, uh, etc. At one point, you know, they may not know whether uh, the, the Greeks had their uh, intellectual, uh, uh, you know, precursors and leaders like, you know, the Velestinis or Adamantis Korais or uh, people uh, like that. But uh, the more foreign powers began to have a hand in the uh, actual state of uh, affairs, the Ottomans uh, could not be neglectful of that international di dimension. Actually, it took a lot of persuasion, quote unquote, on behalf of the uh, other uh, great European states to persuade uh, the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman government that uh, the Greeks uh, should, it, should be uh, independent. So there is an international uh, dimension and the Ottomans took not uh, of it, but uh, it was a funny uh, world, uh, you know, to, contrary to our received uh, wisdom, actually the same story repeating itself again and again, uh, as in case of other uh, fields of revolution, like the American Revolution, you know, the, the kind of division between the loyalists and the uh, patriots, the, the, you know, the loyalists uh, taking refuge in Canada, giving raise to the anglo uh, uh, communities of uh, Canada, we have the exact situation uh, it, it, in this case as well. I mean, many of the, the Anatolian uh, Greeks uh, were actually recent immigrants who, who came to the Ottoman Empire after Greece became an independent country. So the, what was new for the Ottoman Empire was not to lose territory. What was new was that a group of subjects, Reaya, declared independence, got it, became an internationally recognized uh, state, but there were a lot of uh, Greeks, more Greeks, uh, living outside the boundaries of uh, Greece in the Ottoman Empire. So th there wasn't an easy uh, solution to this ambiguous uh, ethnicities and loyalties. You know, people lived in okay. the Ottoman Empire. They were recent arrivals from uh, Greece and their loyalty, God knows, uh, uh, laid where. But uh, they were Ottoman uh, citizens. But at one point, Whenever there was a Greek consul somewhere uh, in uh, Western Anatolia, uh, they could go and register there as Greek citizens this time. So, the, uh, I mean, mind-boggling. Why should people immigrate to Ottoman Empire and be loyalist uh, uh, in, that, in that sense? And uh, a few decades later, uh, they go to the Greek uh, consuls and register themselves for... Mm -hmm. uh, of Greek citizens. So these are questions to uh, chew on. But yes, there was, you know, the, undoubtedly a, an un international uh, dimension to it. And the Ottomans purely took note of that. They couldn't have otherwise. I mean, that's my mm -hmm. <laughs> intake in a way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you. Shikri? Yeah. Um, well, we want to include the Greek War of Independence in the so-called Age of Revolutions. However, the Greek Revolution broke out at a time of extreme conservatism all over in all European kingdoms, the superpowers of the time. Uh, we, are, we are talking about the Vienna Conference period uh where 
the, the Napoleonic Wars had finished and devastated most of Europe, and no European rural, rural ruler wanted to see any kind of uh, popular revolution, uprisings, revolutions anymore. And this is why uh, most European powers patiently waited, waited the sublime port to suppress the Greek War of Independence until they couldn't anymore. I mean, we, we see the, the, this in the uh, communications of the uh, British, French, Austrian embassies reports with their uh, foreign offices. And uh, they even, they, especially the Austrians and the uh, Britain, uh, British, helped the Ottoman state to suppress the Greek War of Independence. Uh, as I said, until they couldn't be impartial anymore. Okay, terrific. I, and now I'm thinking if this could be part, if one should consider this part of the way Ottoman views of the Greek Revolution took shape. That's exactly why I wanted to bring up the larger question, but please, mm -hmm. yes. Because the yeah, panel is, to... after all, about Ottoman views of the Greek Revolution, but yeah. yes. Yeah, that's. I was going to bring it back to that, and I had two sets of thoughts. Um, one is that um, there's a kind of elision in Greek historiography about Greek enlightenment to Greek nationalism. And in the Ottoman realms, that was not necessarily a foregone conclusion. There were plenty, like Fenariots, for instance, considered themselves enlightened. Um, and many Levantines, the very first newspaper of the empire in Smyrna uh, in spring of 1821, days before the outbreak of the revolution, was by a Levantine Black Bay, a Belgian Levantine, who started this newspaper for that very reason. He was enlightened. He was opposed to the, Revo to the French Revolution and then to the Greek Revolution as it broke out. So these things were not synonymous at the time necessarily. There were some people who thought that that was an obvious um, <coughs> connection. And the second thing is that both the Ottomans as a whole and the Fenariots particularly were very focused on the international realm um, not as in the age of revolutions, but as in more like realpolitik before realpolitik, right? That there were factions, mm -hmm. as we know, there were factions within the Ottoman court, factions within Fenariot circles, and factions in the early Greek state based on affiliation with one or another great power, right? The Anglophile party or faction, the Russophile. The... So um, I would say that that's how the international scene plays out in terms of Ottoman... <clears throat> capabilities and horizons in confronting the war of independence and then the ways the Fenariots are implicated in it. It is inseparable, that international context. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, lots of questions. One of my questions <laughs> has to do with the legacy of Byzantium. The first paper actually triggered it with the reference to the Melkites mm -hmm. to begin with. It was right there in the first mm -hmm. paragraph. And of course, your work, Christine, on the Fenariots has led many of mm -hmm. us to reevaluate the question of uh, Neo-Byzantinism, as some might call it. But something, Neo-Byzantinism has uh, charges of a modern political movement in it. So let's leave that aside, but something about the legacy of Byzantium being taken seriously as one's identity, if not one's political something. Uh, what's the role of a new kind of reception of ancient Greek history, Byzantine history, but especially Byzantine history in the uh, cultural framework of the Greek Revolution, do you think? Ah, oh, please, we're just starting. <laughs> we're just getting into... <laughs> No, 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 I'm, I'm joking. Of course, you're right. We have to follow the program. But then I will leave you with this question and with uh, ho hoping uh, maybe Kristen will have a word or two. No? Is there time? No time? Okay. <laughs> okay. Next to be time, continued. Friends, or when we see each other in person, I hope, at some point, to be continued. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. This was a Wonderful panel for thank me you. to reflect, as I said. Thank you, thank you. Take with much. me. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah.
And in fact, I hope Thanks. this kind of reasoning will make an impact on the field. That's was going to be my final question eventually. How do you think all of this will be incorporated? How can it be more productively incorporated into Ottoman studies, this kind of broader vision that one is finally bringing to a major event like the Greek Revolution? So, thank you. 